Good morning. This is January 29th, the year 2001. We're at the Morris Institute Library as part of our Veterans Oral History Project. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. We're interviewing Mr. Stanley Rosoff. Good morning, Mr. Rosoff. Good morning. Thank you for coming. May I ask you um, where you live? Newton, Massachusetts. Okay. And do you have, uh, what is your marital status? Married. And uh, what is your age? Going to be 84. Well, you look good. <laughs> um, do you have any children? Three. And any grandchildren? Eight. Where were you born? New York City, 125th Street and Lenox Avenue. Ah. What was New York City like growing up? Wasn't too happy there, oh. but my fa family was there and we made the best of it. And when did you leave New York City? When I was nine years old. And I was in the fifth grade at the time. Oh. School. Where did you move to? Uh, Brighton, Massachusetts. Yeah. Brighton, Mass. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long were you in Brighton? I went to grade school in Brighton and I was there probably six or seven years. Then we moved to Brookline. Mm -hmm. Did you go to Brookline High School? Went to graduate Brookline High School. And what was it like living in, in Brighton and Brookline in those days? A lot days? different than living in New York. <laughs> That's for sure. Better or worse? Better. Oh, New York was the pits. Yeah. What was, what is your, how would you describe your family background? In what respect? Well, um, sometimes, I mean, we, sometimes the we average, have, an average family. Average family. I mean, Went to, went to movies, right. went to high school, went right. to athletic events. Yeah. My folks were average people. Right, okay. And in New York, my father was in the uh, <coughs> dress manufacturing business, uh -huh. women's dresses. And when we moved, and my mother, by the way, worked for him. That's how she met him. Ah. She was a secretary. Yeah. And uh, they got married and we lived in New York for a while, as I said, and we moved to Boston. My father's, my father's brothers were here. That's the reason we moved here. When and where did you enter the military? I entered the military April 20th, 1942, from Boston, Massachusetts, Back Bay Station. We left, left Back Bay Station April 20th. But I met two or three other fellows that were going. We were all headed for uh, Santa Ana, California at the time. What branch of the service did you join? Air Force. And how did you happen to choose the Air Force? I got rejected by the Navy. <laughs> Why is that? My depth perception was way off base. And they said, I'm sorry, we, we can't accept you because you have to land on carriers. Oh, so you wanted to be a Navy pilot. Right, yeah. exactly. Okay. And they said, your depth perception is NG, and so you'll have to make other arrangements, yeah. which I did. I went right across the street into the Army Air Force office, mm -hmm. took the physical test, passed it, and uh, waited for orders to uh, leave where, wherever I, they were going to send me. What was it called at that time? Was it the Air Force or was it called the Army Air Corps? What was the branch of the service called? Good question. Mm -hmm. Gee, I think it was the Air, 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 United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, right. this is a long, long time ago, Brian. Right. Did your friends join the military? My friend, yes, I had several people, yeah. that, several friends that went in different branches. You know, some some army, air mm -hmm. force, engineers, medics. Everybody went their own way. Wherever they were accepted, they they went. So next, you went to where for your training? Santa Ana, California. And how was your trip out there? Terrific. <laughs> yeah, I, did you go by train? By train. Well, it was it was a it was a very interesting. We made some good friends on on the train. There were three, uh, two two other fellows from Boston that I became very friendly with, and we went through training in Santa Ana together. And we were I was in Santa Ana. Oh, I'd say maybe for five or six months, learning, getting, being indoctrinated as to the 
ways of the uh, Air Force, mm -hmm. l learned identif and identification of airplanes. And what kind of airplanes did you learn to identify? G uh, German airplanes primarily because we were going to the ETO. Right. And Germany, well, we, the Italians didn't fly against us. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any problem, with, you know, identifying it. Their, their plane, but it was the, the 109s, the FW 190s. When you say 109, you mean the, the Messerschmitt 109? The fighters. Right. Fighters. Because we, we knew that we were going to get into heavy bombers, and the fighters were going to right. go after us, right. which they did. Mm -hmm. No question about it. So stayed in uh, Santa Ana for a while, and I went to uh, Dos Palos, mm -hmm. which was in the uh, on the San, San Joaquin Desert. Dos Palos. Dos Palos. Mm -hmm. Went for pilot training there, mm -hmm. and I washed out of pilot training because of my coordination. Mm -hmm. The instructor happened to be a, a civilian instructor. I, I forget his name offhand, but he was a great pilot, mm -hmm. and he said, "Stan, I'm awfully sorry. We have to wash you. You will go to either to a bombardier school." or navigation school. Well, it so happened, they sent me from those Palos to Victorville, California, where I went to Bombardier School, graduated from Bombardier School. From there, I went to Selman Field in Monroe, Louisiana, to navigation school, graduated from navigation school. From there, they sent a, sent a bunch of us up to Ephrata, Washington, mm -hmm. in, the, in the northern, northern Washington, the west coast. And I met my uh, officers there, three, the three, the uh, pilot, co-pilot, and the uh, bombardier. And I was the fourth one to join the group. And uh, we were there for a while, indoctrination and lectures and identification classes and the, everything that had to do with flying, we were subjected to. What was indoctrination about? About identification of planes, okay. customs, Air Force customs, mm -hmm. salute every um, every officer above your rank, things of that nature. And what was your rank at that time? Second lieutenant. When I got graduated from uh, Bombardier School, I graduated with a a promotion of sec two second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And then we after uh, we left the freighter. We, they sent us down to Rapid City, South Dakota. We met the rest of the crew there, all my enlisted men. That is the two waste gunners, radio operator, ball turret gunner, and my engineer. And what were you to be at this time? A bombardier uh, or a navigator? I was flying as navigator. Navigator? Yeah. There, there was a shortage of navigators at the time. And just as there was a shortage of um, Air, airplanes when it came time to fly over to the ETO, to the European Theater of Operation. They put us on a, uh, they sent us to uh, Newport News, Virginia, and we waited for a uh, space on a Liberty ship. They put us on a Liberty ship. We, went, we left September 24th from uh, Newport News, Virginia, and landed in Casablanca, North Africa, October 12th. Columbus Day. Could you tell us what a Liberty ship is like? Liberty ship is a small, it was built by Kaiser in west, on the west coast. Mm -hmm. He was putting them out like crazy. They were moving a lot of mat material and mm -hmm. personnel and everything overseas on the Liberty ships. Because the big ships like the um, Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, they were carrying 1,200, to 2,000 men at a time overseas. They were landing in England. On our ship, we happened to land in Casablanca, North Africa. And we were there in Casablanca for maybe a couple of, two, three weeks before we got a, an assignment to join a bomb group. What did you do in Casablanca for those few weeks? Sightseeing. <laughs> what did you think of Casablanca? The worst, dirtiest place on the face of this earth. Not like the movies? 
Oh, please. It was awful, the dirtiest place on the face of the earth. Believe me when I tell you that. It was unbelievable that people can live in such squalor. It was terrible. Well, they moved us to, uh, to, a, a, uh, to Tunis in North Africa. We spent a couple of days there, and then we moved down to the, uh, up the bomb group that was situated in the uh, desert. Mm -hmm. Not too far from Tunis, maybe 30 miles mm -hmm. south of Tunis. And we uh, started to fly out of there. F flew just a handful of missions out of there. Where were your missions? Southern uh, Italy at the time. Mm -hmm. The Germans occupied southern Italy, and the Fifth Army, I think it was, that was there fighting with them and uh, trying to push them north. And they pushed them past Folger. And at that time, when they got past Folger, they moved the heavy bombardment groups up into the Folger area, to Amandola and Serignola. Mm -hmm. We were based there and we started to fly out of there. From there, we were able to hit southern Germany and countries further, further east. What was your first mission like? First mission it was scary. Mm -hmm. All of the guys were scared, but we had a lot of faith in our pilot, mm -hmm. in Bobby Taylor. I mean, we flew a lot with him in the state, you know, when we were training. And he and Billy Overton, as far as I was concerned, the best in the, uh, in the group. And were you shot at? We were shot at first mission? FLAC. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us, for the viewing audience, what is FLAC? FLAC is bullets that are shot out of 88 <laughs> millimeter guns that explode right. and uh, uh, metal flies all over the... And you, a lot of guys still carry uh, FLAC in, in their bodies. Mm. That, they, uh, that the, the doctors couldn't extract. They still carry pieces of flak in their body. Is the flak from the piece of the ammunition itself or from the debris, the metal debris that it creates? The metal debris okay. that it creates. Okay. And it's very, very powerful. Very powerful. These, the, the Germans could shoot, let's say, up to 25,000 feet accurately once they got your direction and the wind and all that business. Mm -hmm. they, they, were, they were unbelievable, really. I oftentimes, now, I say if there's ever another war, I want the Germans to be on our side, <laughs> not against us. Of course, they, they, were, they, were, they were tough. They really were tough soldiers. And uh, the uh, pilots that flew the fighters, the, I mean, the 109th and the 190s, Fearless, absolutely fearless. They go barreling through a the formation. The Messerschmitt, one on, the Germans and the Messerschmitts. The 109s and the 190s. Okay. They go through a uh, formation. There could be as many as 60 to 100 guns aiming, shooting at them at the same time. They kept coming. They kept coming. On the, uh, on the, uh, one of the missions, I can't think of the name right now, Schweinfurt mission. Mm -hmm. They went after uh, ball bearing mm -hmm. plants. 60 planes were shot down. We lost 600 men on that mission. 60 planes, 10, mm -hmm. 10 men per plane. Didn't come home. Mm -hmm. that's, a lot of pl that's a lot of guys to lose in one shot. There were plenty of long faces that day when the guy we got home. I never flew the Schweinfurt raid because they took place before I got overseas, before I started to fly. But I had a friend of mine that got knocked down in the Schweinfurt raid. And when I got, <coughs> oh, let me go back a little bit. When I got knocked down, I had come off the target of Padua in Italy. Padua was at the, at the foot of the Alps. Mm -hmm. And the Germans had 
several fighter groups located at the foot of the Alps. And when we went over Padua, they came up to greet us. And we flew east after the bombing raid, and we were over the Adriatic and the Gulf of Venice at the time. Well, they came through the formation and they hit us. They blew off Bobby, T Bobby Taylor's shoulder was blown off. And he came back a second time and machine gunned Andy Franco. And the, the flight deck covered with blood from the floor to the, to the ceiling of the flight deck. All the, wall, all the whole flight deck was bloody. And these guys, both of them got killed. But before, Bobby got hit first, Andy pressed the uh, bailout button, mm -hmm. then he got hit. When the bailout button was pressed and we heard the alarm, the th three of us, Marvin, the, my engineer, Billy Overton, the bombardier, and myself, st started to go back towards the bomb bay to get out of the plane. Because when we got hit, the plane was on fire. Yeah. Marvin went out first, he bailed out. There was a cloud deck underneath the plane at the time. You could see it through the, through the open Bombay door. And uh, I said to Billy over, uh, to uh, Billy uh, Undercover, I said, Bill, you're next. He, he, got, he went up to the uh, to jump out and he froze in the Bombay. Actually froze. Well, at that point in time, I mean, it was, it was time to get out. I put my foot on his rear end and I pushed him out. I lost sight of him as he was going through the cloud bank. Then I went out. At that time, it must have been between 40 and 50 below zero up there. We were flying at around 22,000 feet, if I'm not mistaken, in that particular. And where were you? Do you th where do you think you were? I, th I thought perhaps we were over land because I couldn't see the, because of the cloud bank. Right. But down I went, right into the Gulf of Venice, and I went down deep when I hit. The chute was open, going down. On my way down, I noticed a fishing fleet to my, to my left, along the shore, an Italian fishing fleet. And I only praying that they would see us and come and pick us up. But before we went out of the ship, Andy, Andy uh, conversed with the uh, radio man and told him to send out a May Day call. That was something we, we were going down. Well, we, I went down and I jumped out. My hands were absolutely frozen. I couldn't pull the toggle switch on the May West to inflate the May West until I was probably a thousand feet off the water and then I pulled it and inflated in time to hold me up. I went deep when I hit the water. The flying suit I had on had uh, woolen uh, lining and the flight boots must have weighed two ton they got when they got wet. And I went deep and when I came up, the shroud lines from the parachute were like a like a, a uh, spider's web all over on top of the water. Mm. I said, I'd never get out of this damn thing here. I finally managed to get out of the uh, out of the uh, chute. I opened up the harness and got out. And uh, I passed out. Mm. The water was that cold. I was conscious for about a minute and a half to two minutes and I passed out. And I was told I floated, I was floating around about three hours in the water. Wow. Being held up by, with the, uh, oh, by the uh, Bay West. And the Italian source, the Italian fishing boat source, they got to us before the British Air Sea Rescue launched it. Mm -hmm. Five minutes before. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Five minutes, if they got there five minutes earlier, I would have been taken back to England and turned back over to the American American control. Well, anyway, they picked up Marvin, my engineer, and myself, 
Billy Overton they couldn't find. He was afraid of water. When we were in the freighter, and we used to go on weekends to Seattle, go swimming in the pool in the, in the hotel, he'd look at the water and break out in a cold sweat. That's how afraid of water he was. It was unbelievable, really unbelievable. Well, anyway, when I came to, I was in the Italian fisherman's hut, laying in a bed. I was laying one way, and Marvin was laying the other way. And they had all kinds of blankets on us and everything, trying to get our temperature back up where it belonged. Well, while we were laying in bed, I heard a truck pull up, or a car pull up in front of the hut, and in came Germans. Carrying gun, or rifles and so on and so forth. And the next thing they were the hollering was, Rouse! Let's go out! Mm -hmm. Rouse! So we didn't move fast enough for them. I got whacked in the back with, by the rifle butt. I took two shots in the back. And they took us up to a uh, German hospital up in Venice. And Marvin and I were there for two or three days under covers and under guards. What was your medical condition? I was, I was in good shape. At, but, and, you know, I had passed out because of the cold. I had picked up hypothermia. And when I got, when we got to the, um, to the hospital up in Germany, up in Venice rather, I was, you know, feeling not too shabby. Mm -hmm. Although I did take two shots in the back, and they kept us up at the in the hospital for, I think three or four days we were there. And one morning they came and said, "Well, now it's time for to move." So they took Marvin and I, and they took us on, a, uh, on one of the gondolas in Venice and paddled us up to the uh, railroad station where there was a train waiting. There was a, tra a train, yeah. We got on the train. Oh, by the way, uh, going up to the, through the canal, they took us up in a Chris Craft motorboat. The Germans did? The Germans did. An American Chris Craft. We couldn't believe it. Marvin and I couldn't believe it. Where, so where the devil did they get the, uh, you know? Well, they had it anyway. Took us up to the railroad station. We got out of the ra at the railroad station. Put us on a, on the train, and we started up through the Brenner, Brenner Pass. Going through the pass, snowing like crazy. Which pass? Brenner. That's and do you mind if we just back up a little? You said before you took two shots in the back. I think we missed something. Were you shot? No, two. But I two they was a rifle butt. Oh, okay. Okay, two, go ahead. Two shots from the okay. back. <laughs> and uh, they took us up to this um, interrogation center. Everybody got out of the of the uh, train. There, there were some guys on the on the train that wanted to try to escape, but it was a blizzard blowing through at the through the pass at the time. And the senior American officer, the SAO, said, absolutely not, You're gonna, you'll jeopardize everybody else. If you guys get away, these guys are in trouble, mm -hmm. the fellows that were still there. So we stayed on the train, and we went up to uh, Bologna to an interrogation center. They put us in a solitary confinement, the first thing, mm -hmm. into a uh, cell. Cell was uh, four feet wide, eight feet long, ten feet high, with a single bulb hanging from the ceiling that never went out. How long were you in solitary? I was in solitary up there maybe five or six days before they interrogated me. And what was the interrogation like? The interrogation, I was ta taken into a, uh, like a conference room. There was a long, mahogany table, I would call it. You could see a face in it, it was so highly polished. And there was a young German officer sitting up at the, he said, come on, sit down over here, right next to him. And um, your name, I told him my name. Your rank, I told him my rank. Serial number, I told him my serial number. 
Where did you fly from? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I forgot, I don't know where I flew from. He said, you were in the B-17? I said, I don't, re I don't remember what, what the uh, ship was, 17 or 24, whatever, in the 20. I said, he said to me, that's not important. We know that you flew in, you were flying in the 17. And he says, I know what you had for breakfast this morning. I said, you do? I said, what did I have? And he told me what I had for breakfast. Yeah. I said to myself, how in God's name did he, does he know? <laughs> and he told me where I slept in, in the hut. Yeah. They had a, a spy system that was absolutely unbelievable. So we, we got talking and he offered me an American cigarette, which I, don't, I didn't smoke. I said, no, I don't smoke anything. He says, well, you don't want to answer my questions. I'm going to ask you a question now. I said, go ahead. <laughs> He said, how did the, uh, how are the Pittsburgh Pirates doing and the New York Yankees, the baseball teams? Yeah. I said, well, to tell you the truth, I haven't seen an American newspaper for months. I can't answer your question. I said, now it's my turn to answer your <laughs> question. I said, where the hell did you learn to speak English so well? He said, I was a Pittsburgh school teacher before I came over here. He came over in 1933 to visit his parents. He was German, okay. and they wouldn't let him out of the country because oh. he knew American customs and he could speak English better than better than you and I. I'm telling you, he was this guy was unbelievable. He said, "Well, okay, you're not going to give me any information." Said to the guide, "He's all through." Well, they put me back in solitary again. I spent eight or nine days in solitary. And they fed us. What did they feed you? <laughs> Erzatz coffee, <laughs> Erzatz bread, and margarine. Wow. And it, no soup? Once in a while soup, if you want to call it soup. It was, the, it was awful. What was in it? Oh, you're liable to see a, a horse's eye in it or something like that. And, they, and blood sausage. Limburg, uh, Limburger cheese that smelled, you could smell it from here back to Newton. It was <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. Well, the guys got, had to get used to it. I mean, that was the only thing that they fed us. Yeah. And the soup that they fed us, we called the green death soup. Green death soup? Green death soup. Mm -hmm. Well, I was in Bologna for a while, then they put us on the train, and they said, you're going to see a permanent camp now, but you got to go for another interrogation. Mm -hmm. They took us up to Frankfurt, Maine. Frankfurt? Frankfurt. Okay. Got to Frankfurt, and right next to the camp, right next to the compound, there was a big IG Farben chemical plant. Would you repeat the name of the chemical plant? IG Farben, F-A-R-B-E-N. Okay. okay. They, were manufa they manufactured chemicals mm -hmm. for the war effort in Germany. And evidently, the uh, Germans thought that the uh, American Air, the British and the American Air Force wouldn't bomb the, uh, the uh, factory, so they put the, the camp, like from here across the street, mm -hmm. the proximity of the camp. Stayed, in the, stayed there, and one night, we, while we were in, uh, in solitary, the uh, air raid alarm went off. They emptied all the, soli all the uh, guys out of the solitary confinement, put them in a uh, air raid shelter that was on the ground of the compound. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me go back a second, please. When, when we got to, first got to Frankfurt, we got off the train, all the glass was, was, was broken. The, the station had been bombed. Mm -hmm. And there was five American airmen hanging by their neck from the girders. We could tell they were Americans because of the clothes that they had on. And the guard, the German guard said to us, there were a bunch of us, if you guys don't behave yourself, you'll, be, you'll join those guys up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was really, that was the first time I had seen any dead person, right. you know, besides on the, on the plane, Bobby and uh, Andy. So we, taken into the air raid shelter, 
and the uh, RAF came over that they sent 800 planes over that night to bomb Frankfurt. They were dropping big ones, 4,000 4, pounders, 1,000 mm -hmm. pound bombs and so on and so forth. And the earth was shaking, the vibration. There was the, uh, the uh, air raid shelter had trees for support lining the walls and the ceiling. Mm -hmm. There was a kid sitting next to me, so as far as Karen, Karen is sitting away from me. <clears throat> One of the uh, logs cracked, came down, hit the kid on his head and splattered his brains all over the air raid shelter. Died just like that. Which wasn't, we weren't too happy. That night, when after the, uh, they got through bombing, they put us back into the uh, solitary. <clears throat> Next morning they moved us out of the camp because all the wire was knocked down mm. around the compound. Where did they move you to? Put us on a train. Yeah. They said, you guys are going to your permanent camp now. Right. So most of us went to Sagan. Sagan? Sagan, mm -hmm. S-A-G-A-N. Mm -hmm. Stalag Luft Three. Stalag Luft Three. Right. Okay. And while we were walking from the camp, from Frankfurt to the railroad station, we, we learned that 800 people were killed that night in the bombing raid. All the utilities were knocked out, and the population was lined, lined the streets. They had size, baseball bats, rakes, anything that they could hit us with. They were ready to go after us because we killed them. You know, the, uh, the uh, fly, flyers, although they were the British, and uh, the houses were blown off the uh, foundation. Mm -hmm. And they were going after us. You mean the civilians, the German civilians. civilians? That's right, the civilian population was going after us. Well, it got so bad that the Germans gave some of the, our prisoners their rifles to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it got. But when the civilians saw that, they backed off. And we were marked, because there were plenty of guards guarding the column of, of men that were walking towards the train. And they had several trains there that had taken the prisoners to different compounds. Now, where was this train that you were boarding? It was uh, in Frankfurt. In Frankfurt, and you're on at, your way at, to Sagan. At, a, at okay. another, right, at another railroad station, and we were on our way to Sagan. Right. Well, we got on the train, we went to Sagan, we got off the train in Sagan, and walked to the, into the camp. Mm -hmm. I walked into the camp, I see a kid I went to high school with. He was behind the wire. I said to him, Rev, what are you doing here? He says, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I said, I came to see you, <laughs> you know. Well, he got knocked down in, uh, in Schweinfurt, yeah. and he was there six months before I got there. And uh, when we went through, entered the camp, we were taken to the senior American officer's office. And we were interrogated by him to make sure that we weren't plants, that the Germans didn't put us in there, you know, to find out what the, what the Americans were doing. What was the rank of the senior POW? He was a colonel at the time. Colonel? Okay. Colonel Clark, his name was, Bob Clark. He got shot down in 1942 okay. over North Africa. Terrific guy, West Point. Terrific. And what kind of questions did they ask to make sure you weren't a plant? What's the capital of New York State? Okay. What's the capital of Boston, of uh, Massachusetts? Who are the American League teams? You know, things right. of that nature that only an American would know. Right. The Germans wouldn't, couldn't care less about that. So they established the fact that the guys were all Americans and they assigned us to rooms, permanent, permanent rooms, permanent beds. And I got into a uh, room that every, every one of the uh, inhabitants of the room were from a different state. What branch of the service were they from? All Air Corps. Okay. It was an Air Corps compound. We were out there, we were in South Compound 
and North Compound had the British. That's where the great escape took place. Right. From the North Compound. And um, I got to camp on the uh, March 23rd, and the night of March 24th, the Great Escape took place. That's when 76 guys got out, 50 were shot, three of them got back home, back to Sweden, and the Germans picked up the rest of them, and they were thrown in the, uh, into the cooler, put into the jail, one month, if I'm not mistaken. Were you aware of the Great Escape no, the day that it happened? No, absolutely not. How did, how did you become aware of it? How did we become aware? <laughs> when they stopped bringing the guys back, and they started to converse o over the wire, we knew that the Great Escape had taken place. When you say converse over the wire, what do you mean? We were in, in, in the South Camp, they were in North Camp. There was a, a what they call a dead man's uh, piece so, of land between the perimeter, the high barbed wire, and they had low barbed wire along the walk. Mm -hmm. And if you went in over the low barbed wire, you were liable to be shot. shot yeah. So the guys talked. The, the, uh, the British had the same thing on their, on their compound, the North compound. And they got, we talked back and forth and we, we did this when we learned about the Great Escape. It was bad, very bad. Fifty guys got shot. Awful. There was there was mourning all over the place. The guys were, you know, really upset. They lost a lot of friends and I have at home the whole story of the Great Escape. Right. And and you read it and you can just visualize what took place. The tu the tunnels that the guys built, they went thirty feet deep. Because the Germans used to bring in tanks, run it over the ground, mm -hmm. and if they, if they, if the uh, tunnels were just a little ba little way below the, uh, the ground, they would collapse. But at 30 feet, they shored them up with uh, bedboards. Nobody had a bedboard when they were building. The guys were sleeping on. Uh, I can't think of the word. That's okay. Rope, rope, uh, rope. Hammocks? Mattresses, hammocks. Oh, hammocks, yeah. And uh, it, it learned to get, get along like that. Because once the, uh, the, the guys got out, the Germans found the uh, tunnel, the tunnel. At the time, there were three tunnels being dug at the same time in the British, Tom, Dick, and Harry, hmm. the name of the three tunnels. Hmm. And they found all of them. And naturally, they brought in equipment and they knocked, knocked, put them all out of commission. What were your barracks like? They were long wooden buildings. They had, uh, I think, 15 rooms, plus two rooms down at the end for the uh, senior officer of the barrack, and one room was a kitchen. We had a kitchen down there. And who, how did you cook? What kind of utensils did you have? We made utensils out of the clim cans, out of the milk, milk cans, yeah. the powdered milk cans. Yeah. The guys were absolutely unbelievable on what they could do. They forged every piece of paper that a, a German soldier carried. Where did you get, getting back to the food, I'll get to that in a second, getting back to the food, what did you use for fuel to cook? They gave us briquettes. And what were the briquettes made of? Coal dust. Okay. Now tell us about the forgeries and the... the oh, the uh, guys got very, very friendly with some of the ferrets. And what's a ferret? A ferret is the uh, a god, German god. god. And at night, they used to come into the camp with dogs and turn the dogs loose. For to, what purpose? To see that nobody was outside walking, getting ready to escape. Mm -hmm. 
although we did have one of the uh, one of the uh, sergeants who had wor worked in the cookhouse, he went what we call round the bend. He was he couldn't stand being behind the wire anymore, so he started to climb up the uh, the wire cut machine gun. They, they, let, they left them hanging there for two or three days for the guys to see. Wasn't the most pleasant thing in the world, but. The dogs used to go underneath the buildings. The buildings were raised about two feet off the ground, mm -hmm. and the ferrets used to go under the, to listen to the conversation if they could hear any. And they used to send the dogs under there. If anybody was under there, the dogs oh, would, you know, get them out. Well, the guys got smart, the, the POWs that were held. They took old razor blades and went, they went, uh, they, they themselves went under the, uh, the uh, huts, put the razor blades in the sit in the on, on the in the wood, so when the dogs were under, they got all cut up, and they never went under the under the buildings again. The Germans finally smartened up to the fact that we can't afford to lose these dogs that way, so they didn't even bother. They they stopped that practice right away. And we, uh, we were there in, in uh, Sagan until uh, January 27th, I believe it was. What was your day like in prison from the time you got up to the time you went to bed? Played bridge all day. Bridge? Okay. We, we uh, were given uh, vegetable seeds by the uh, Red Cross oh. and the uh, And the uh, YMCA, mm -hmm. and we planted small gardens outside to, to grow food in the in the, you know in the summertime, the growing season. Not that we grew a lot, but whatever we grew, I mean, was in addition to what we had. Now, how long were you at Stalag Luft Three? I was there about eight months. Eight months. Nine months. Did you get any mail? I got mail. Yeah. You saw? Oh, you, you were. At, that was the first mail I wrote to my folks. Card. They let. It, they gave us cards. I think they allowed us uh, two two letters a, a month or what, something mm -hmm. like that. What was the mail call like? How did the Germans give you your mail? They uh, had a uh, a guy came in. A, a German came in, and. They had an American standing right next to him to read the names. And the American read the names, and the guys all gathered around, yeah. and they raised their hand if it was, you know, their name was called, and the letter was passed on to how them. Did, how did you feel when your name well, was called? The best feeling in the world, <laughs> to get, get mail from your folks, you know, or family, and it was an experience, I'll tell you being in prison camp for a while. Then, then on January 27th, we were notified that we're going to be moved yeah. because the Russians were approaching. Right. And the Germans didn't want us to fall into their hands because they knew that the Russians would turn us back to the United States control and we'd be flying next day mm. against them again. Right. And we, it was about 30 or 40 below zero when we left camp. The guys didn't have the right clothes on, believe me. It was so cold, and we were walking in a blizzard. The, the uh, leather of their shoes froze to their feet, and we stopped at a uh, pottery plant. The furnaces were still warm, and the guys tried to take off their shoes, and the skin from their feet came off with the, le you know, with the, with the shoes. The f leather froze. This to, right to the skin. Let me get this straight. Where were you being moved to? You were we moved out of Stal Stalag Luft three. Down to Mooseburg. Mooseburg. Okay. Which and was what, not too far from Munich. And what was the name of that camp? Stalag Seven A. Okay. And that was the pits. And in what oh. way was it the pits? The dirtiest, 
We couldn't sleep indoors because of the, the lice, the bed bugs, mm -hmm. the fleas. Guys try to sleep in, in, indoors. They come out with their face all swollen at night, uh, in the next morning rather, and their legs all bitten. I have fellows in my POW group now that still carry scars from being flea bitten. Now, Stalag Luft III was all uh, Air Force officers. What right. was the and, 7A? And, and, wait, and they had, there were some enlisted men in, 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 in okay. three okay. who did the cooking in the cookhouse. Did the cooking, okay. Right. And what, what was the composition of the Stalag 7A? Everybody was in the 30, if I'm not mistaken, 33 countries were represented in Stalag 7A. And all branches of service? All, everything. And officers and officers enlisted, enlisted men, men. Okay. generals, colonels. We were there for oh, I think maybe a month or so when we heard guns being fired, and uh, one morning we got up. All the guards around the camp were gone. They had the Hitler Youth out there guarding the camp. Mm -hmm. The rifles were taller than the kids, young kids, right. 10, 11 years old, carrying rifles, walking around the camp. Before we knew it, it was noontime, and over the hill came a big United States tank, which knocked down the barbed wire fence around the camp. That was around noontime, right. if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, General Patton, in one of the jeeps, one of his jeeps, came into camp, standing up with the two pearl-handled pistols that he carried. And following him, they brought in a mobile bakery. And they started to bake white bread. Were you allowed to eat to your heart's content? Or did they portion we, you? The guys ate pretty good, and did they get sick pretty good? Yeah. Because their system, you know, couldn't couldn't handle it. Just couldn't handle the amount of food that they were trying to eat. But wh while all this was going on, one of the fellows, he happened to be a doctor, Doctor Allian, his name was, from Shreveport, Louisiana. I I used to speak to him when I got home. I used to call him down in Shreveport. They pulled down the, the uh, German flag, the swastika, off the flagpole, and they ran up an American flag that Dr. Allian had made while he was in prison camp. How did he make it? He sewed it together. Yeah. They took the wool, they took uh, the wool out of uh, the thread, right, out of socks or jet, whatever it was, the color that they needed, red, white, and blue. And they ran it up the flagpole, and the guys went crazy yeah. to see the American flag instead. And all the kids that were guarding us disappeared. And from then on, we were under the control of the United States Army. Mm -hmm. General Patton was, it was his, uh, one of his tank groups that came in and uh, liberated us. And we had to wait in camp for transportation to go to Camp Lucky Strike in Lahore, France. Before we get to Camp Lucky Strike, I just want to go over the food that you ate when you were a prisoner. Uh, apparently you got coffee and black bread and that horrible soup. Green, green death soup. Green death soup. What else did you have for food? Blood sausage. Mm -hmm. The worst. Limburger cheese. Right. The worst. What about Red Cross packages? We got Red Cross packages. Mm -hmm. Not as often as we should, mm -hmm. because the Germans confiscated a lot of them. Although we had a storeroom that they were supposed to be, you know, kept in, and uh, between the censors who cens censored our mail and the Germans who confiscated food packages, two guys had to live out of a food pack food package for some time, mm -hmm. a week or so. Mm -hmm. Although the food package that, that we got from the Red Cross was, was pretty good. There was some good food in there. Mm -hmm. 
good food. What was the other thing that intrigues me is the role of cigarettes as a currency. Was there a lot of that we going had, on? We had, we had what we call the Food Echo, ACCO. Mm -hmm. And it was a store. Right. And they traded food items for cigarettes and cigarettes for food items. And this is run by the POWs? Run by the POWs. Yes. It was food, they called it Food Echo. Mm -hmm. And uh, it worked out pretty good. You know, a lot of guys didn't smoke, and a lot of guys did. And in the Red Cross parcels, there was there was cigarettes. Yeah. And in the uh, uh, parcels that uh, the British send in, there were cigarettes too. But play of cigarettes, the guys didn't like them. So they used to trade with the uh, Germans. Were you able to get the Germans to bring you material in from outside the camp if through you, bartering? If you brought bar, if you you uh, bribed them. With what? Some of the guys received women's silk stockings in their packages from home. Ah, knowing that they could barter it. You got it. Ah. They bartered the silk stockings for information. They, our camp had several ra radios in, the, in it. And the how guys made get, the radios. And how did they get the parts of the radios? They made them. Yeah. The only thing they couldn't make was the tubes. Right. And they bribed the German ferrets to bring radio tubes in. Yeah. And they did. And the guys made radios. They they knew the BBC. They used to listen to the BBC all the time. Do you remember listening to the BBC? Yeah, British Broadcasting. Yeah, but you remember listening to it? No, I never listened to it. Yeah. They were secret of this. Only certain people. Certain people, okay. They didn't want that information spread, you know, because they figured if the, uh, the uh, Germans got a hold of a, a POW and put him through the ringer, he might tell. And they didn't want that to happen. Were prisoners allowed to go to have their own religious services? They what? Were prisoners, the prisoners of war, allowed to have religious services? Yes. And yeah. How did that work? Very well. We had a Padre McDonald from Scotland. Right. When he was speaking, you couldn't get in the theater. We built a theater out of crates that the oh. food parcels came in. And when Padre McDonald was speaking, there was a lineup of, of guys oh. trying to get into the theater to listen to him. He was fantastic. Yeah. He got, I think he got picked up in either Dunkirk or uh, he par parachuted in yeah. behind the lines or something like that. But he was great. And they held all kinds of services, you know, on Sunday. He was a great person. Another thing I sometimes hear about is uh, prisoners managing to make some kind of music. Were there any music? The YMCA. We had three or four orchestras in camp. We had professional musicians in camp. Really? Guys that played in, you know, big orchestras here in the States. And where do they get their instruments? YMCA. The oh, YMCA, just mail them in? They okay. send them in. Yeah. The YMCA and the Red Cross, you know, they all send in uh, stuff for the uh, for entertainment purposes. Were you allowed to play uh, sports like softball? Yeah, we had a sports field. Uh -huh. The British naturally were playing soccer. Right. That was their, you know, the national, one of the national games. We played softball. We didn't, if we didn't have a softball that, you know, at the time, guys used to take socks and roll them up tight and use those as a, as a ball. Let me say this to you. The fellows were very, very creative. Mm -hmm. Very creative. You know, I sometimes, when I lie in bed and I think of what went on, I say to myself, boy, they were, they were something else, you know as a unit. Yeah. They were unbelievable. They forged stuff. They made uh, blowers to cook by and everything. It was, ever, it was unbelievable. You it, just couldn't believe what they, these guys were doing. It's a, I know it's a stereotype, but it sounds like that TV show, Hogan's Heroes. Did you ever Forget see that? It. That, was a, that was the biggest farce that ever hit the <laughs> 
get the TV screen. <laughs> Nothing like that, believe me. Nothing a like that. After you were liberated, you were taken to, oh, go ahead, I'm let sorry. Me, let me back up a little bit. When I bailed out of the plane, yeah. that made me eligible to join two British clubs. And what were those two British the clubs? The Caterpillar Club and the Goldfish Club. And what is the Caterpillar Club? Somebody that saved their life using the parachute. And why is it called Caterpillar? Because the Caterpillar made the silk. Oh, okay. And the parachutes were made of silk. Okay. And the, Cat and the Goldfish Club was somebody that bailed out, landed in water, and was saved. Great. And you're a member of both. Both. And I believe you're wearing a... Oh, my, yeah, I, can see, this I can see, yeah, the gold caterpillar well, and the goldfish. And goldfish. After your liberation, you were taken to a place called Camp Lucky Strike. Lucky what, Strike. What is that? What is Camp Lucky Strike? That was a reception center for all the prisoners of war mm -hmm. waiting to go home. Run by the Allied forces. Run by the, uh, by yeah. the uh, British, American. Mm -hmm. and, and what was that like? Fantastic. <laughs> they fed us six meals a day. <laughs> Well, let me tell you something. I had a friend of mine who was in prison camp. He lost 100 pounds in 100 days. Who he, waited on you? Sergeants. In Camp Lucky Strike? No uh, Germans were waiting on you? German prisoners? No Germans. Okay. We had a, that was a strictly an American camp there. Okay. They didn't want this, any foreigners there because they were still away on the ships okay. to go to the United States. And they didn't want that to happen. You know, these guys were pretty, pretty clever. So tell us more about Camp Lucky Strike. That was a, uh, that was a collection point mm -hmm. for POWs waiting to, to go home on board boats because they didn't have enough planes to carry, take everybody. Mm -hmm. The ones that they took home by plane were the seriously injured and the sick guys. Mm -hmm. They flew them home. And where was the camp? La Havre, France. La Havre, okay. La Havre. And, and how long were you there? We were there quite some time waiting for trans transport. Okay. We finally got on a boat. I think it was called, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was called the, the uh, General Turner. Mm -hmm. The name of the, I'm not sure of it in that one. All right. And uh, a fighter group got on with us. This fighter group was being transferred down to the Caribbean. So we got, we were on the boat with them. When we pulled away from the dock, the captain said, all POWs are going on a cruise now. <laughs> going on a, what is the guy talking about? He's got to have rocks in his head. Yeah. He said, we've got to take the fighter group down to the Caribbean. You guys have the run of the ship. You'll get, you'll get meal tickets as to what uh, section you, and go and yeah. get your food. And we were on the ship for, I don't know, 10, 11 days while we, they cruised from La Havre, France, down to the Caribbean. And uh, when we got to uh, uh, the Caribbean, they wouldn't let us off the plane, off the ship, rather. They wouldn't let us off. Why? They didn't want us to talk to anybody. They wanted oh. us to disembark the fighter group, right. and you guys stay, stay put. The next thing we heard, the captain of the ship made an announcement over the loud speaker system. We are now heading for New York. Oh, how did you feel? That was it. <laughs> that was it. Well, we, the guys, went, they went out of their minds. It was real exciting. Six or seven days, we cruised up to New York. And one morning, we got up and we were entering New York Harbor, and there was the old lady standing there with the torch. Yeah. Well, did you ever see a thousand guys start to cry at once? Uh -huh. The guys broke down to think that they were home right. after being incarcerated, you know, the way they were. And along the shore of, of, the, uh, of the harbor, they have big gasoline tanks. Job well done, uh -huh. welcome home. The guys were crying like babies. <laughs> and they had fireboats come out to meet the ship, you know, and they were spraying water all over the place. And they had big military bands on the, on the dock. And 
we took us quite a while to get off the boat because the guy had to, you know, they had to get all their belongings together. And we finally got back uh, on the United States. On, on the ground, the guys got on their hands and knees and kissed the ground. Oh. But they were crying and the women, you know, the wives and were there. Oh, what a sight. What a sight. I'll never, I'll never forget that one. And uh, we, some of us, most of us were taken to Camp Shanks in New York. Camp Shanks? Shanks, S-H-A-N-K-S, okay. ov overnight. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Camp Shanks, there was a line from here to the end of Natick, guys waiting to use the telephone. Right. Well, I th my turn finally came up. Okay. I got on the telephone, called my folks in Brookline, and I, my father said to me, where are you? I said, I'm in Camp Shanks, New York. I'm going into the city. Before I could say another word, the line went dead. Oh. My mother picked up the, uh, the phone. Yeah. I said, where'd Dad go? Oh. He's on his way to, the, to Logan to get on the oh. uh, plane to meet you at, at Uncle Max's store in 40, uh, 43rd Street in New York. <laughs> I said to my mother, what do you mean he's on his way? He, he's on his way to, to meet you, meet you at Uncle Max's store. <laughs> but before I could turn around, my mother walked in. She got on the next f flight <laughs> to meet me in New York. Well, we had a big party that night. Yeah. And uh, I got home. I got back to the States June 4th. I, and I got back to the to Brookline June 6th. And naturally my mother had a big party and all the family was there and so on and so forth. That's my story. That's wonderful. Now, uh, some of the questions we like to ask our veterans, uh, how do you feel about the way you were treated in your homecoming versus the way uh, veterans of other wars were treated? For example, the, the Vietnam it's veterans. totally different. And how was that? We were welcomed home with open arms, and the Vietnam veterans were not. Mm -hmm. They didn't recognize the war. Am I correct? It was an unrecognized war, and the guys were just, just passed over. But we were welcomed with open arms, the POWs. Did you find that you were prepared for, the Army prepared you for the cultural differences that you encountered uh, uh, among the, the, the men you fought with? No. You weren't prepared? No. In, in what way? <laughs> they did their thing and I did my thing. Right. I mean, but we, we fought when we were flying. Right. We fought as a unit. Right. I mean, I depended on you and you depended on her and mm -hmm. we would, a very closely knit ten, ten men. I lived with my uh, with the, the officers on my picture. Mm -hmm. Twenty four hours a day, I was with them. I never spent so much time with my wife or with any of my friends. No, seriously. Right. So you developed close friendships. Oh, please. And are you still in touch with some of those men? They're all gone, oh. unfortunately. Yeah. I lost nine nine guys when when we got. Oh, he got hit. Did you take advantage of the GI Bill? No. When you returned? Didn't need it. You mentioned your, uh, you tell me about your education. Uh, I went to BU. BU and before the war, after the, before, before the war. Okay. And, and then I went to Harvard Graduate School. And what, business. In business. And that was it. Right. And what did you do? I, uh, I taught accounting when I was in prison camp. We oh, had, that's good. We had a, uh, <laughs> We, all, we had a uh, POW University. Oh, I forgot. I wish I'd asked. Okay, POW University. And I taught accounting. And what were other courses being taught? Everything you could think of. Yeah. There were guys from all, you know, all walks of life. Yeah. Every state in the union was represented in prison camp. So you did more than play bridge all day? Oh, yeah. yeah we, okay. We had shows. Yeah. You know, guys put on shows. We had two or three orchestras in camp. They put on mm -hmm. concerts. What kind of shows did they put on? Uh, I can't think of the name of yeah. But good, you know. Musicals? Good. Yeah. They, and they, they, uh, the uh, Germans gave us permission to hire 
costumes. The guys paid, yeah. you know, the, uh, the uh, Germans brought in costumes for us. They hired them and we paid for it. You know, <laughs> you know, and, you know, it had its light moments and its yeah. heavy moments. How do you feel now about um, uh, the war effort? Well, look, I hope there's no, never another war, that's right. for sure. Because if there is, they're going to they're going to have one tough job getting some of the veterans to uh, to to go. Right. Because the way they treat like the Vietnam veterans, those guys won't go to war. Right. They won't go to war. And uh, look, I hope there is never another war. I mean, I'm right now. I'm concerned about the children. Right. You know. There is another war. They're going to go. They'll have to go. They'll cons conscript them. What was your opinion? Uh, did your opinion of the Germans change before the war versus a after the war? Yeah, they were. They were. They were something else. They were. They were well organized. Yeah. They had a very strong caste system. Mm -hmm. The officers were were were, law, were guards. The uh, Enlisted men took orders that no questions asked. Mm -hmm. I have tapes at home now, about many tapes about the war, and so the Germans were unbelievable. They really were. What would you say was your most memorable experience as a prisoner of war? Before or after I got uh, knocked down. Uh, Either, whichever is most memorable. When when Bobby Taylor had his shoulder blown off and, and uh, Andy Franco got machine gun. Right. That was that and uh, one one f mission I'll never forget, that was the mission over Steyr, Austria, where the Germans were dropping bombs down the, down on the formation and the planes were dropping like flies. Mm -hmm. And what was your most humorous experience? No such thing. <laughs> yeah. No such thing as humor. No such thing. Did you join the reserves upon your return? I was in the reserves until 1955. Okay. And did you uh, join any veterans organizations? I belonged to uh, DFW and JWV and yeah. the POWs. And mm -hmm. look. Is there any? I paid my dues. Is there any uh, thought or memory you'd like to share uh, now, now that we're ending the interview with the community or for the future, someone watching yeah. this tape? Population should cherish freedom. Right. And freedom is not cheap. Freedom is not cheap. This man lost a lot of guys. Right. I lost a lot of guys. Right. Not cheap. But the, I don't know whether the people realize that, that freedom is very, very expensive, and they should cherish every minute that, that they have it. That's my story. Well, thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to add uh, that, I have, that I haven't asked you? You didn't ask me what these were. Uh, uh, what are those? <laughs> <laughs> these. Each one of these represents a city right. in which we held a national convention, yeah. the POW National Convention. Right. These, we, we buy these, well, I don't know what you call it, ladder steps or whatever, right. and we add them on. Oh, that's great. These are all the cities that, I've, right. that I attended meetings in. Great. And anything else you, you wish that I had asked you? Well, I want to thank you so much for... Oh. My Wonderful interview. My pleasure. Yeah. Look.